Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's program with Rianne Eisler. She's here with us to have a conversation about her book, Nurturing for Humanity. I'd like to thank you all for being here with us today. Donna Mills will be our host for today's program. I'm Kate Trinka, the Global Read Coordinator for the Charter for Compassion. We'd like to thank all of our generous donors who make it possible for today's program to be offered to you at no charge. Thank you so much. Your generosity has been outstanding. We're so appreciative. If, you, if you'd like to uh, see your name or a logo or something uh, up here, we, we would love to have you. Um, we have three levels of sponsorship. Uh, it's a three-tier program, as you can see here. And this is where we could feature you, your picture, uh, your company, your organization's logo um, before every global read that you sponsor. We have a wonderful course coming up through our Charter Education Institute. We have several wonderful courses throughout the year, but the one that's coming up next is starting on Monday, and it is called Reimagining Our Future. And they got really creative. Speaking of creativity for resilience and sustainability through COVID, they got creative with the acronym and changed it to uh, Compassionate Organic Visionary Imaginative Design. So hopefully you'll be willing to join us for that. Thank you so much. Next month, we will be having a conversation with Robin Wall Kimmer on our global read. She'll be joining us on November 24th at 7 a.m. Pacific time, discussing her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. We're really excited to have her here with us. Again, just a quick little sponsorship thing. Um, just send me an email and I can tell you a little bit more about it and answer any questions that you might have. Now, I'd like to introduce you uh, to our host for today's program, Donna Mills. Um, she will be introducing Rian shortly. And um, Donna lives in the aesthetically stunning Pacific Northwest specifically in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. She is a woman committed to all things that elevate human consciousness. She is a practitioner of the healing arts, an advocate for civil conversations, and a community educator. She is the founder of Human Well Integrator Health Healing and Wellness, where she sees private clients healing through trauma and grief. On the consulting side of Human Well, she designs integrative workplace wellness programs for large and small businesses. The name Human Well was created out of her unwavering need to know how do we human well? We can see where we are missing the mark in society, but where and how are we getting it right? So I want to welcome Donna and I'll let um, her introduce you to our steam guests while I insert all the links that I mentioned uh, about the different programs that we're offering. Um, please use the chat room if you have any questions for our esteemed guest uh, today, and I will bring those forward to Rian at the end of our program. Thank you so much for being here with us, Donna, and I'll let you take it from there. Wow, thank you, Kate. That was great. Um, and welcome everyone to the call with Dr. Rian Eisler. I have been blessed to work with Rian for the past decade or so in one capacity or another. I have completed her partnership-based programming through the Center for Partnership Studies, and I have read many of her brilliant books. I consider it a privilege to live Rianne's ideals in every and each step of my life. If it isn't partnership, I probably won't be there. Or rather, if partnership isn't there, I'll probably be the one bringing it. I consider Rianne's work imperative, essential, necessary, again, imperative. I consider Rianne my hero if I have ever had one. Her life is and has been a sacred commitment to a new narrative of humanity and one that strikes my heart straight into the center. I believe Rian, is, Rian Eisler was born a visionary. Rian spent her first just six years in the safety and affluence of her native Austria. I imagine as most six-year-old girls must have been, playing with friends and beloveds, joyful and carefree until Nazi Germany came to Austria and all forms of safety ended for her. Rian's family fled to Cuba and eventually to the United States, 
all the while experiencing the complete loss of her previous safety, sacredness and affluence. The la landing in the land of hopes and dreams was just that, hopes and dreams, but very little reality of manifesting said hopes or dreams. Rianne was baffled by the inconsistencies and hypocrisies in how people were treated in a country that pledged and justice for all. So she began to dedicate her life to this research. How are we able to treat each other with such disregard? What systems have elevated separation and dominance? What are our other options? Dr. Rian Eisler is an accomplished attorney, one of the greatest social scientists of our time, president and founder of the Center for Partnership Studies, editor in chief of the Interdisciplinary Journal of Partnership Studies, and an accomplished author of many books that sit on the shelves of my library, including the world renowned The Chalice and the Blade, Sacred Pleasures, The Real Wealth of Nations, and Tomorrow's Children. And really, Rian, those four books sum up and illuminate the four cornerstones of your newest book, Nurturing Our Humanity, How Domination and Partnership Shape Our Brains, Lives, and Futures, published by Oxford University Press. I began my year this year blasting conversation with Rian discussing how we got here with the Charter for Compassion Women and Girls Sector V2020 series earlier in January. And it is my deep blessing to be able to close out my year again in conversation with one of my favorite people on this planet. I introduce you to Dr. Rian Eisler. Rian, I'd love for you to say hello and share with us any other introductory elements of your book, maybe the four cornerstones and why you chose them. And then perhaps maybe they chose themselves and then we can move through our conversation organically. Well, thank you so much, Donna. And it is really a pleasure uh, for me to be with you and to do this. Um, and I want to also thank Kate uh, for making this possible, as well as all the others at the Charter for Compassion. And um, I'm excited about this book about nurturing our humanity, which as Donna said, came out with Oxford University Press last year. I had been working on this book for about seven years, um, just fascinated by how neuroscience is really supporting the findings from my study of human societies of human possibilities. And then I invited uh, my co-author, Douglas Fry, the noted anthropologist, to be my co-author. And among other things, uh, because aside from his just very great general knowledge, uh, he is one of the world's authorities on how we humans lived for millennia in foraging societies, which he calls the original partnership societies. Um, so that was a really tremendous addition uh, to this book. And I guess um, what it really does is it draws from both the social and uh, biological sciences, especially neuroscience, uh, to, well, to tell a different story, a different story of our deep past, of our more recent past, of our present, and most importantly, uh, for the possibilities for our future. And as Donna mentioned, it does introduce um, for cornerstones that we must shift from domination to partnership. Uh, and they're not the usual ones that you hear about yet in the mainstream conversation. They are childhood, gender, economics, but a different economics that goes beyond both capitalism and socialism, and story and language. And I can very briefly, since you asked me to start with that, uh, tell you uh, why are these the four cornerstones? Well, if you look at the most regressive, repressive regimes of recent times and all through history, really, uh, 
regimes that in terms of the partnership domination social scale introduced in my work orient to the configuration of the domination system, whether it was Nazi Germany or Stalin's former Soviet Union, you know, Western, but one leftist, one rightist, uh, whether it was Khomeini's Iran, a religious society, or an Eastern, of course, or the Taliban, or ISIS, or the rightist fundamentalist alliance in the West. In other words, transcending the categories we're so used to thinking uh, of societies in, you see that actually they pay particular attention to these four cornerstones. And indeed, every regression to a rigid domination system has made it a priority to return or to maintain a, quote, traditional family, which is code, of course, for an authoritarian, rigidly male-dominated, highly punitive family. Why? Well, as Nurturing Our Humanity and the neuroscience shows, uh, what children first observe or experience impacts nothing less than the architecture of our brains, how our brains form and develop because we are not born with fully formed brains by any means. Um, so they recognize that, don't they? And they recognize that this authoritarian, rigidly male-dominated, highly punitive family is foundational, both in terms of childhood and gender, to a domination system. But unfortunately, many people who consider themselves progressives, for them, these are still just, quote unquote, women's and children's issues. And of course, to marginalize or ignore the majority of humanity does tell us a little bit about how crazy, and I mean really crazy, the assumptions behind our economics, our values, yes, our stories, and our language have been. Um, so I think I'll stop here for just pause here and um, return it to Donna, who probably has some thoughts here. Oh, there's so much in all of that, Rian. Thank you for that um, introduction to the of the cornerstones. You know, when you talk about the rigidity of the male dominated family. I was introduced to the term um, phallocratic in opposition to um, patriarchy, right? There's so much like, oh, down with the patriarchy right now. But the true essence of patriarchy just means fatherhood. It means, and, and fatherhood is an important element. It's a deeply um, important element. And so what I think that we are dealing with is a phallocratic um, system that has turned into something that's muddied up the patriarchal system. Um, do you have thoughts on that? So, so I guess um, <clears throat> obviously phallocratic, you know, the value is on the phallus versus not having one. So I'll, maybe I'll leave that open for you. Well, it's an arresting term, certainly. I prefer domination family mm -hmm. uh, because that's what it is. Uh, if you really think about it, what caring children receive in a domination family, whether it's from a woman or a man, okay, from their mother or father, is just completely entangled with coercion. Yes. And so it's small wonder then that people who have this family as the ideal norm and, and or were brought up in that kind of family tend to vote for strong man leaders. It's familiar, especially in times of uncertainty like others, like ours right now, you know, with climate change, with the rapid shift to a 
uh, post-industrial economy, not to speak of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is, I hope we will use to not go back to the old normal, my gosh, and normal in which in this affluent United States, one fourth of all children lived in poverty. We, we don't want to go back to that normal. We want to create a new and better partnership oriented normal. So while I, I, I think, you know, language is very important, I prefer not to, well, first of all, you know, when you said phallocratic, I couldn't help but think of the vulvas and the phalluses in old Stone Age caves, <laughs> uh, where really sexuality and spirituality, you mentioned my book, Sacred Pleasure, had not yet been torn asunder. And were, yes, vulvas and phalluses were part of the sacred imagery. Uh, because I don't want to say that there's anything wrong with men. And unfortunately, phallocratic does have that implication. Consider that it is not just men who internalize this notion that, quote, real masculinity means not being like a woman. That is, caring, caregiving, nonviolence are devalued, right, as feminine. It's women themselves to the extent that it is often women who will call men who are sensitive, who are caring. And yes, there are these men uh, all over, uh, that they're wimps, that they're sissies, that they're, quote, weak sisters. So I'm suggesting that, yes, we need new language. And that we need a language that is perhaps descriptive rather than um, sort of accusatory is what I, would, what I would suggest. And we certainly need to get beyond right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, because as I just said, there are repressive and violent regimes in every one of these categories and have been. And moreover, if you really think about it, our conventional social categories either marginalize or ignore nothing less than the majority of humanity, women and children. And that is truly, uh, I mean, <laughs> It's nuts. It's really insane. But we've all inherited that. And especially those of us who have been, quote, educated. Um, we, I, I remember when I first realized that in all my years of so-called higher education, there had been hardly anything by, about, or for people like me, women. And there's hardly anything about children. As the historian of science, David Noble, uh, mm -hmm. wrote in his book, uh, if you think about so-called modern science, it, about 600 years ago, it came out of a monastic, celibate, misogynist, clerical culture. So to use the title of his book, indeed, it was a world without women. And I would also add a world without children. And it wasn't until 50 years ago, a mere drop in, you know, even in recorded history, that we even had women's studies, men's studies, gender studies, queer studies, uh, something so basic and uh, really, uh, we've all inherited, especially, as I said, those of us who are, quote, educated, right? This way of marginalizing anything that has to do with the majority of humanity, women and children. And my research and the research that has led to all these books and that has led, yes, to nurturing our humanity really shows that you cannot see what has to be done for systems transformation if you just look at such an incomplete picture. Hmm. 
Thank you. You know, Rianne, um, <clears throat> I, I deeply appreciate this conversation and I've seen some feedback from some of the chat coming through here. And I think it's important to note that we're in definitely a year of shift, if not a decade of shift or decades of shift and moving from this domination system into a partnership system, at least that's where I, that's where I'm planning on going. So um, I love that we're able to have the conversations about the narrative and how we move from one language to the other, because you're right, I absolutely am in alignment with domination over a phallocratic um, term, because anybody can be a dominator. And I saw um, comments coming through there um, to, to that point. And I wanted to read a quote from from one of your books from the chalice and the blade and um, i found this in an article today that i was reading earlier um, on your website and the quote is um in this model speaking about the partnership model and this is in the chalice and the blade in this model beginning with the most fundamental difference in our species between male and female diversity is not equated with either inferiority or superiority superiority and i think that it's so wonderful to have these because i you know i find myself stuck in like oh this word and then somebody brings up a new word and then i go oh let me consider that but you're right bringing it all the way back around to whether it's a domination or a partnership eliminates any it, it just makes it um without judgment and i love that kind of speaking and um you know this this year at um, the women and girls sector at the charter for compassion we have taken on the mother's day proclamation um, from julia ward howe who spoke to the um, spoke to women to rise up and to put aside war and to come together to what can we do to move beyond um, the societal constraints of domination. And so in that, and this year in 2020, I was also looking at other articles of yours and how mothers have would it be would it be correct to say mothers i don't know that who's suffering worse that's really such a terrible question but how mothers have found themselves in a place finding balance between work and child care and keeping their family safe and not not sending children back into schools or child care centers the can you speak to what you've seen as the struggle in the system this year for mothers specifically well, it's not a new struggle, <laughs> but the COVID-19 pandemic has really revealed so how uh, really uh, <laughs> imbalanced, unjust, uh, the lack of resiliency, the lack of reality. I mean, the stock market keeps going up and yeah, and so do evictions and so does homelessness and so does hunger, hunger in this wealthy United States even. So uh, as I said, we cannot go back to the old normal. Uh, look, a, a lot of my work has focused on uh, the interconnection between how domination, let, let me perhaps back up a minute. Because when I talk about a domination system or a partnership system, I don't mean working together. You know, people work together in domination systems. I mean, think about it. Uh, cartels, oil cartels, monopolies, terrorists, criminal gangs, they all work together, don't they? Uh, so that's not the difference, even though the certainly the partnership system really is more conducive to uh, working together to cooperation. Uh, but it depends for what, right? And it, uh, anyway, look, this is the, the contrasting configuration of these two systems. And it's very different from what we've been taught is the thing to focus on. First, in domination systems, you have top-down rule in both the family, family, yes, and the state or tribe. 
By contrast, as you move to the partnership side, you have more egalitarian, more equitable relations in both the family and the state or tribe. That's the first component. The second part of the configuration is really how gender roles and relations are constructed. I mean, there are two forms of humanity. I mean, lots in between, but basically these two basic forms are female and male, right? So in domination systems, you have the ranking of one form of humanity over another. What does that teach us? It teaches us to equate difference, beginning with that fundamental difference in form, with either superiority or inferiority, with either dominating or being dominated, with either being served or serving. And remember what I said about our brains and how they develop, I mean, 85% of our brain architecture is laid in the first five years before our critical faculties come into play at all. So when children have this model of our species, they have a template for equating all differences with those, you know, ranking, dominating, being served or serving, whether it's based on race, you know, like the racism in the United States, whether it's based on religion. And I don't just mean anti-Semitism or anti-Muslim. Look at the Middle East. It's Shia versus Sunni, Sunni versus Shia. And not coincidentally, the ideal family norm is a domination norm, still to a very large extent now. There are many people challenging it, thank goodness, but in that region. Uh, but there's something else, and I alluded to it, which is the gendered system of values. Uh, because not only are women considered inferior, but so is anything stereotypically in domination systems associated with femininity. And what is that? Caring, caregiving, nonviolence. It's a crazy distorted system of values, but it plays out in economics where for both Marx and Smith, the work of caring for people starting in childhood was so devalued. Well, it was supposed to in their time to be performed for free by a woman in a male controlled household, so much so that if a woman, a wife was negligently injured, she could not sue for her injuries. Only her husband could for loss of her services. That is how it's still oriented much more to the domination side. And that's reflected in the fact that there's nothing in either socialist or capitalist theory about caring for nature or caring for people. So we have to move to a caring economics, but it's the gender system of values. The third thing, the third part of the configuration, which is very different, obviously, in a domination or partnership system, where yes, a caring, caregiving, nonviolence are valued in both women and men, as well as in social and economic policy. So the third part is the degree of abuse and violence. And if you're gonna maintain these rankings of domination, whether it's man over man, man over woman, race over race, religion over religion, uh, you have to really ultimately back it up by fear or force, don't you? Whether it's in the family, so you find in domination systems, socially accepted uh, child beating, wife beating, uh, pogroms, lynchings, warfare, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not to say that there's no violence in partnership-oriented societies, and it's always a matter of degree, but it doesn't have to be built into the system. And the fourth component, very different stories and very different language. 
especially stories about human nature and language like social categories. Uh, you know, linguistic psychologists have long told us that the categories, and this is very true of social categories, provided by a culture's language channel our thinking. So it's almost impossible to really even envision an alternative. And what this work does, it describes the alternative to an unjust, uncaring, violent, and abusive system. Uh, which is because deconstruction and protest, it's yes, it's important. Resistance is important, but we also have to think of reconstruction. And that's where this conceptual frame comes in. And we've just launched a campaign at the Center for Partnership Studies called Make Partnerism Mainstream. And I invite all of you to go to partnerism.org org uh, and to join us and to really start changing the conversation and yes make mart partnerism mainstream because that's the only way that that we will you know a colleague of mine calls the conventional social categories weapons of mass distraction mm -hmm. and they sure do they fragment our consciousness yeah. Thank you. So in your decades of doing this work, I'd like to ask you, uh, this is a silly, it's gonna sound like a silly question, but I want to know, do you see us moving in partnership? Here we are in 2020, where it seems like the crux of domination has arrived. Um, but I'd like to know from your viewpoint, have you seen partnerism increasing despite the fact that the domination seems to be at its highest right now? Well, it isn't at its highest. I mean, you want its highest and you go back into prehistory mm -hmm. when the roads were lined by the Assyrians with crucified people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah thank <laughs> or, you. Or the European Middle Ages when entertainment yeah. uh, and cruelty for real, not just in, in videos and in, inter, you know, in, in celluloid, was torturing and tormenting people in public. So no, but um, I think this is the time to really look at fundamentals, which we haven't done mm -hmm. for good reason, because we've been told not to do it. Right. When we were preparing for this, and I sent you a meme that I found that was from a, a woman, and it's just a single woman. So um, I take this and I also put it in the context of uh, a, a mother, whether it's a mother with a partner or a mother without a partner. Um, and the woman is asking, you know, I still have no idea how people can work a full time job cook dinner often, exercise regularly, enjoy weekends and keep an apartment clean. It seems basic, but I can't consistently do it. And the response to her, her plea was current full-time 40 hour work jobs aren't designed for single parents, single people, much less parents to do this. They're post-war relics and depend on the unpaid labor of a spouse for cooking, cleaning, shopping, et cetera. You're not deficient for not being able to do that yourself. Well, look, this is why we absolutely have to move to a caring economics that among, starts really with showing the economic value of the work of caring for people starting in early childhood, whether it's done in the market or in the household. But remember, both socialism and capitalism ignore the three life-sustaining economic sectors the natural economy, the volunteer community economy, and the household economy. I wrote a book about that called The Real Wealth of Nations, and I returned to it, of course, in nurturing our humanity. Uh, we have to start thinking differently. You can't just tack on uh, caring policies. And by caring policies, I don't only mean paid parental leave, uh, generous, you know, the countries that have moved more towards partnership, Northern European countries, all have it. 
we don't in this country yet. Uh, you know, I mean, they invest quite a bit in early, in high quality early childhood education. That is essential, not only in human terms, but in purely economic terms in our post-industrial era, when we keep talking about high quality human capital, right? Flexible, creative people. We know from neuroscience that whether or not we have these kinds of people largely hinges on the quality of care and education children receive in their first years. So we need parenting education, leave behind spanking, leave behind the old ways of that are appropriate for domination systems, frankly. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the thing is we can do it, we have done it, we did it for millennia, not ideal societies. And there are so many trends in that direction. And consider that the misery we're seeing in this country is because we don't value caring and caregiving and nonviolence enough. There are those of us who do, but the policies haven't. And, you know, we have a chance to change that. Both this election, which is very important, as well as um, really all of us sort of digging in and help. You, you're already working on so many of these cornerstones, but it's part of a larger movement. Uh, I mean, the movement towards partnerism. I agree. And I think that I'm hoping, you know, our political system will shift in that direction as well. I, I, you know, when I read your book, The Real Wealth of Nations, I was in one of the programs with the Center for Partnership Studies. And then one Sunday I was at um, Unitarian Universalist Association um, where I attended and um, I was sharing with one of the professors there that I was reading your book. And, and of course it was, he was um, an economics professor and I wanted to know what he thought. And so I shared with him your economic caring policies and he says, hang on a minute, Donna, are you telling me you want to get paid for being a parent? And I said, well, let me ask you this question. What do you get paid for? And he goes, well, you know, I'm a professor. I teach economics to students. I said, so you're getting a paycheck and a financial benefit for what you're doing to teach economics to college students. But as a mother raising two children, I, I don't deserve a similar, or maybe it's not a deserve, but do you see where I'm going? And he was baffled. He couldn't say anything. He had nothing to say. And I said, we clearly value you teaching economics to students over me raising children if we're going to look at it as a who gets a paycheck for a paycheck type of thing. And you are having more impact on the future individual than he is. Right. I mean, that's the, the truth. Youngest. Right. Because, right. because they're little and we know from neuroscience that if we have any sense, we would invest in parenting education, in support for parenting, in support for caregiving. But that's not the only thing. When I speak of a caring economics, I speak of policies that have as their goal caring for people starting in childhood and caring for our natural life support systems. So we would not invest all of the money we do in prisons. Agreed. We would Agreed. invest it in caring for people so that they don't end up in prisons. Uh, I mean, it is really, but remember, the people, look, what, what, when you think of, of, of money going into prisons, think of the domination archetype of the punitive male head of household. That's what it's about. If you think of warfare, we can argue, well, you know, we shouldn't have this, we shouldn't have, invest so incredibly disproportionately. I mean, I'm a Holocaust survivor. I believe we need in a world where there are other countries that orient even more to the domination side, we need defense, okay? 
we need some armaments. But what we have in this country is is ludicrous, really. I mean, the amount. But but that's the another domination archetype. It's the hero as killer, as warrior, right? Think of our epics. Think of our TV programs and our, I mean, our blockbusters. So a lot of soul searching here. But once you get it, it is really not that complicated. Both women and men are, are actually wired. We know this from neuroscience, and it's all, all there in Nurturing Our Humanity in the book. Uh, we actually, the pleasure centers in our brains light up more when we share and care than when we win. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we are not a blank slate when we arrive on the scene doesn't mean because we have such a very, very flexible brain that we're not going to try to adapt to our domination environment if that's our culture or subculture. And especially in families. I mean, people are really taught to deflect their pain, their anger against those who are causing them the pain, you know, their caregivers to whatever outgroup that you know, remember the in-group of mankind and the female other? All right, you know, so not coincidentally, these people also adhere to these very rigid gender stereotypes, which think of all the men who are today diapering and feeding babies. I mean, this is not innate. Caring is a human capacity. So I think that with this frame, with this understanding, um, and I just saw a question in the from Victoria, expound on thoughts about heroes, caring economics versus dominance of hero. Uh, my wonderful partner and husband, uh, David Loy and I wrote a book called The Partnership Way. And it's a workbook for both the chalice and the blade and for sacred pleasure. And I would say it's really a workbook for all of my books. And there's a whole section in there uh, inviting kids to pick partnership heroes and heroines or dominator heroes and heroines. And you know, uh, we do, I mean, we have some Bono, for example, I don't know about his personal life, but in public, he is a partnership hero. He is devoting himself to caring, right? We have them, but how much prominence do we give them? Uh, that is the question, isn't it? But I really recommend pick up The Partnership Way by Rian Eisler and David Loy. And you'll find all kinds of activities that you can use. And I also wrote a book, by the way, called The Power of Partnership, which is kind of my version of a self-help book. And actually, it won the Nautilus Award as the best self-help book of the year. But it's very different from most self-help books, not only because it uses the frame of the partnership domination configurations, uh, but because in those seven relationships that it examines, it starts with how we relate to ourselves. You know, is it that you're not good enough voice that we've in her internalized? Uh, or is it a more validating partnership voice? And how do we change that? So it's how we relate to ourselves, our intimate relations, our uh, work and community relations, but then it goes on to our national relations, our international relations, how we relate to nature and our spiritual relations. And each chapter has practical activities. So that's another very practical resource, but all my books are really practical resources because once we shift our thinking to stop thinking right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, and all of that distraction, uh, then we free our creative energies. And that's what I'm counting on you for. 
to use your creative energies and be part of the partnerism, make partnerism mainstream movement. Fabulous. Kate, do you want me to read some of these questions that are in here or would you like um, to? I, have, I, you can, but first I wanna um, respond to the, or bring forward the questions that were in the Q and A that you may not have seen. So I'm gonna do that first. And then if you, if you wanna grab the ones from the chat, that'd be awesome. Sure. Um, so um, from David, he says, I love the goal of 50% leadership goal in politics and institutions to write the balance of male domination. Will you please comment? Yeah. Well, we need that balance, uh, certainly, but what we need is a real partnership between enlightened men and women. And I don't have to tell you that just being female does not really mean that you haven't embraced domination values and domination systems as God-given or nature. You know, this is really interesting. I mean, think of original sin or selfish genes, right? It's the same story. We're bad, we have to be rigidly controlled from the top. I mean, so <laughs> it's a question of really looking at what we've been taught with different lenses that explain a lot of things that just seem random and disconnected. But this, all this said, it's not coincidental that in Sweden, Norway, Finland, women are 40 to 50% of the national legislature. And what happens is that as the status of women rises, men, no longer find it such a threat to their status, to their, quote, masculinity, to also embrace more stereotypically feminine values. So they pioneered caring policies, universal health care, uh, child care, high quality child care, uh, really better rewards for teachers, uh, a very generous paid parental leave for both mothers and fathers, caring policies, and they're not socialist. I mean, they have a very healthy market economy and it's not because they're small and relatively homogeneous. Think of all the small, relatively homogeneous societies that are very domination in oriented and do not have caring policies. But see, we have to think for ourselves. And what this frame provides is a different lens that makes it possible for us to see differences, to see, to see things that have been marginalized or ignored, connecting the dots. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, a very early on question that came in from Donna Joy. Does racism fit in with the four cornerstones that you discussed? Absolutely. Look, remember what I said, and maybe you asked the question before I said it, but I want to repeat it. It is not coincidental that for regimes that have a lot of in-group versus out-group scapegoating, you know, whether it's Shia versus Sunni or Sunni versus Shia, whether it's scapegoating Jews, you know, anti-Semitism uh, like Nazi Germany or scapegoating whatever, you know, and certainly scapegoating, quote, uppity women, which is how, uh, you know, assertive women are classified in domination systems, right? vocal women who, who use their voices. It's not coincidental that these are scapegoated. So racism in the United States is just one variety of in-group versus out-group thinking. And it is a terrible thing what happened. I mean, the slave trade, uh, you know, I, as I said, I'm a, a Holocaust survivor, but that too was a Holocaust. And the effects linger. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I tell you, you cannot just erase racism 
without looking at the whole system and changing the kind of family structure that demands in-group versus out-group thinking, the kind of culture that only gives you two alternatives. You either dominate or you're dominated. Mr. Trump said, you know, it's all about domination. Poor man. I mean, that is the universe he grew up with. That are the only alternatives for him. We have to change the system. But to answer your question, the answer is yes, a resounding yes, that eliminating racism goes along with the shift from domination to partnership. Thanks again. I, and maybe you just answered this to some degree, but I'm going to ask it just because of, I don't want to miss what maybe this person was at, wanting to get from you. Um, I'm wondering, what are the first practical steps we need to take in order to shift the paradigm after reading the books or taking your course? Well, look, we have the power to change our consciousness. That really, why do you think we have all of these stories telling us that, you know, we're bad and we need to be controlled and, you know, original sin, selfish genes? It's to maintain a certain mindset, a certain lack of consciousness of alternatives that is fundamental to domination systems. You can change the way people talk by introducing this frame. Changing the conversation is a very important thing. Changing the conversation in your own sphere of influence, but also working with others to change the mainstream conversation so that making partnerism mainstream becomes a reality. Building the four cornerstones you don't have to build them from scratch. There is movement in that direction. I mean, for the first time in recorded or domination oriented history, we have documented the pandemic of violence and abuse against children and women worldwide. I, that's in, uh, in the book, In Nurturing Our Humanity. You, you'll find a lot of that. A lot of people ha are not even conscious of it. Uh, you can work on any piece that attracts you. Is it children's rights? There are organizations working on that. Is it uh, changing the devaluation of women? And is it working for paid parental leave so that we don't have all of this unnecessary suffering? Of, of everybody, parents and children, I mean, and society, uh, there are a zillion steps. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. But at the same time, help everyone from your own circle of influence to the larger conversation to change, to take into account these foundational four cornerstones. Childhood, gender, economics, going beyond capitalism and socialism. I mean, keeping the partnership elements of markets, which we don't have a free market, <laughs> as well as having policies that, uh, government policies that are caring. The, the, the COVID-19 pandemic showed we need both government policies and markets, didn't it? But the issue is what is the guiding, what are the guiding values? Are they partnership oriented or domination oriented? And you can do so much to change the story and change the language. Start using this new language, just use it. So there are a zillion things for you to do and get the organizations that you belong to, to understand that uh, so much of what so many of these so-called alternative not-for-profits, et cetera, are doing is really part of the movement toward partnerism. 
Yes, thank you. And I'm going to use that as a segue. Um, uh, Charlie Barker is on and and uh, has, is our chairperson on, on the board for the charter. And he says, you know, please let Rian know that the charter is committed to uh, education, compassion, and training from cradle to grave. We've got Think Equal for pre-K. We have C Learning for K through 12. And then we have comprehensive programs like compassion integrity training. And so just a little plug there uh, for the charter for compassion. And then I'm just gonna, Donna says she's gonna take a couple questions from the chat um, and bring those forward to you. And then just give me a minute at the end to wrap everything up and we'll be good. Well, um, well you <clears throat> covered all the questions I thought that, um, that I had scrolled through. I really wanted to scroll back and get to some of the ones in the front and um, you brought those forward. So I, I will just um, finish with thanking Rian and for this opportunity. And then just also, I, th I think that what you said is so important and impactful to start with self and then go with each concentric circle out into, you know, who are you voting for? What are their policies? Um, what's happening in your town? Where's, you know, boots on the ground compassion and partnership happening and, you know, taking them to your different organizations. And so I don't want to, um, uh, go, Rian, it looks like you had something else you wanted to well, say. I was just going to point people to our websites, really, because yeah. the partnerism site is very useful, but we also have another site mm -hmm. uh, in addition to partnerism.org, and that site is centerforpartnership.org. And that site is just chock full of resources, chock full of ways, if you scroll to the bottom of the home page. Uh, of ways that you can be strengthening what you are undoubtedly already doing, uh, even though you may not have until now used the term partnerism or partnership system. Uh, so go there, learn. Uh, remember, socialism became a global movement because people really immersed themselves in Marx's writings to understand them. And then added their own creativity. Now, it's a deeply flawed theory, unfortunately, as I said. It, it, I mean, as Marx said, you know, first we've got to deal with class, and then maybe we can do something about the cold woman question. He had it backward, completely backward, okay? Because if you have that model of the species of in-group versus out-group, you're going to dehumanize the out group and you're going to keep trying to amass more and more and more junk and stuff because it's a system that does not meet anyone's real human needs starting with our innate human yearning for caring connection so wow. we, thank we you can't thank you so much Rian. sorry I said, we can change things. And these writings really do offer you the uh, roadmaps that we need. Thank you. So I, I did. It. And did sign it. up, sign up, sign up for our mailing list and become what you already are an agent for transformation from domination to partnerism. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for being here with us, Rian. Um, you're just amazing. Donna, thank you for leading us in this conversation. Thank you to all our guests and participants for being here with us. Um, I want to remind you that next month we do have um, Robin Kimmer coming on with us for our Global Read. Um, I've, I've put several links in the chat room for us um, to, to uh, latch on to. I'm just gonna throw up my slides really quick here. Oh, we did those already, sorry. And um, I wanna just remind you that if you'd like to uh, donate for 
future goal leads, uh, this is the way to do that. You can either go to the charterforcompassion.org slash donate, or just email me, Kate, at charterforcompassion.org. Again, thanks everyone for being here, Rian. You are a blessing to this world and a gift to us. Thank you so much for your time, energy, and spirit, and thanks, heart. Thanks. Thank you, and thanks, Donna. And thank all of you who joined, and all of you who will revisit this or visit this. And I look forward to perhaps seeing you at our next uh, webinar um, on Make Partnerism Mainstream. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening or good morning, wherever you're coming in, coming to us from. We'll see you next month. Bye.